Yes, thank you. Um, as uh, Michael said, I joined uh, Eternity a couple of years ago, actually in September of 2017. And um, that time it was a little bit of a reboot in the Erlang development. Uh, and we were lucky to assemble a pretty impressive team. I've grabbed um, some pictures from the Eternity website archive. Uh, I think it would make a pretty good roster for um, for an Erlang conference. And uh, I think it's particularly nice to see that Professor John Hughes finally leveled up to Erlang developer. I think that's, you know, well-deserved. Um, so we uh, set out to build a complete blockchain in Erlang, complete, including developing a new contract language, writing a virtual machine for that language, the full blockchain, state channels, oracles, everything. Now, I guess it's actually, we wanted to build an entire ecosystem and uh, you tend to run into the problem that, so you need SDKs and you need tooling to, to attract users. But of course, the SDKs have to be built against the core, so the core API, APIs have to be stable. So that, that will be a, a problem in, at the best of times. Um, I think right now, or in this project, we also had a possibly slightly overpowered core team that sort of you know, took the lead and, uh, and was working quite fast. I think we were considered to be one of the most productive teams in the blockchain industry during these years. So in some areas where we really needed um, some user feedback to figure out what would really be the, the most attractive uh, structure and APIs, we felt that we were held, uh, held back by the fact that not everything was in place so that we could get early adopters on board. So, and just a few words on, so the, the thing about blockchains is that they're trustless. That's sort of the cool thing about them. You have a trustless distributed uh, payment or, you know, state network. Uh, so, but, the less cool things with blockchains usually is that uh, speed is terrible and um, usability is often uh, quite bad. Now that somehow comes with the territory because if you think about what creates good usability, usually it comes with handing over trust to someone who can then give you a convenience API, put a picture there up on, um, uh, the slide with contact, contactless payments. So in Sweden, they just upped the limit for how much you can pay contactless without having to enter your PIN code. Of course, that reflects the some of the uh, trust that has to be awarded the other side, like the payment providers, trust, that you can make payments without going through the entire authentication process. And of course, you trust that whatever is going on in your phone uh, before it beeps and says, you know, something happened is, is actually the right thing. And, and you trust that your account details didn't get stolen along the way and everything. So, the whole thing about trustless is that you, you don't really want to trust anyone. So it, what you could imagine seeing along the line, along the, down the, uh, down the road is that you will build trustful applications on top of a trustless infrastructure. And this actually makes sense, but then the APIs in this trustless core will have to be sort of still um, well structured so that you could deal with this and as an application developer and provide the right level of convenience and productivity to the user. So this becomes hard. 
Now, what we want to focus on a little bit here is state channels. Now, state channels are basically a way to speed things up. You, uh, you create them off-chain. So they're essentially a one-to-one -one, uh, conversational channel uh, where you would um, typically do a, an um, open transaction, which is an interaction with the chain, and then you can load uh, value into the channel, you can load contracts, and then you can go ahead and do fast updates on that channel. Everything is co-signed, so it's still trustless. And then you can do other chain interactions like depositing more funds, withdrawing funds, doing snapshots, and then finally you close to the chain and then you get the funds distributed according to uh, what has happened on the channel. So this has been uh, sort of a big promise of blockchain for several years. It turns out that it's really very difficult to make this work in a way that people can actually use it and write applications on top. So we've done our best to try to do this uh, in terms of how it's built inside the Eternity node, which is an Erlang node, um, running the blockchain database and doing the sync and consensus and transaction handling. The client would spawn uh, gen state M FSM, uh, which actually handles the complex state machine stuff. Uh, you will have things like a, a chain watcher that subscribes to events from the chain and notifies the channel FSMs um, if something changes with their channel object on chain. Now, since it's trustless, that could actually happen sort of as um, a subversion. If the other client doesn't want to play nice, they could actually pretend to work with you on the channel and then actually subvert you on the chain. So we have a state cache so that we can actually recover the state if you, if you drop out or if the FSM dies. And uh, so we've been trying to build this uh, in a way that, you know, uh, Erlang-y in that we have robustness, uh, flexibility, we can handle complexity and everything. And then to the client, we have an RPC a JSON RPC WebSocket API, where you know the client will have to do the signing and everything, so you don't give away your keys to the Eternity node. And then we also inform the client of different events. So, but we didn't have enough clients, so we decided to try to do something else. Uh, we found Alex. Um, we um, were discussing that we could have someone doing rapid prototyping next to the state channel team. And we decided that we wanted to do this in Elixir, partly because we were also imagining that um, one party in the state channel might want to be a backend server. And, uh, and we felt that we could do this instead of Erlang because Elixir is stronger on the user facing side, the, the UX. Like, I'm not talking so much about the language, but that may also be true. But the community focus is stronger. But you can still reuse all the Erlang libraries. You use pretty much the same uh, patterns. And, um, and you can also do in context synchronous RPC without blocking the thread or without losing the thread and things like that. Very nice, very productive. So that was the idea. Now, while since this turned out well, we also decided to do more stuff in Elixir. So we're rewriting our middleware node in Elixir. And for that purpose, we wrote a little plugin app, which essentially just wraps a fully installed Eternity node, starts it up, and sets all the code paths so that you can then write Elixir apps on top of the Eternity node inside the Erlang VM. So you have ac actually access to all internal APIs and everything. Now, Alex's stuff does not actually use this. So I will let him uh, 
explain a little bit what it's been looking like on his side. So, Alex, over to you. Okay, guys, so let's see. Now we're changing presentation here. Uh, give me just one second here. Zoom is not my normal tool. Let me see. Does this work for you? Yes. Yep, okay. So first, let me introduce myself. I am Alexander Filipov. I have my own company where I do my consulting things. I've done it for eternity for the last year. And I've also been working in the automotive space where I do some Elixir for Volvo, which I think is really fun. It's low level project, which, which shows the strength of the ecosystem, the vertical strength, low level going all the way up. And that's who I am. I used to be really low level and I've been going up the stack. I've been Android apping, I've been doing OpenGL drivers and, and now I'm fascinated by functional programming, it's my latest thingy. And of course you want to be in the guys in the Eternity team if you're fascinating with Elixir and Erlang. As Ulf already mentioned, you know, it's like a doctor. Doctor is an inventor of this, inventor of that. By the, by the way, this guy invented this language. This guy was in the forum of the standardization forum of this language and, and so forth. You have connections to the Chalmers University of Sweden, which is a very strong foundation of functional programming. And then you have this yellow guy. It's our super cool system reliability engineer. And rightmost, that's me, the Elixir guy. Um, and yes, to be honest, these guys know Elixir as well, obviously, and it's, pro it's proved to be a really nice crowd. Um, I'm going to tell you now about my story of onboarding this team, how I uh, both like technical stuff, which I did, but I intend to show you also the de the demo. So you see what we actually achieved. Um, so Ulf was the one who onboarded me personally, and he wanted to have someone who could like really show uh, what we could do with the state channels. And uh, it, you could also call them like user acceptance tests, you know, does it really, it's one thing to fire off uh, channels in unit tests and there's a lot of channel tests in, I mean, this is a blockchain software it's a heavy focus on quality, obviously. So there's a lot of testing there. But it, just because it runs in a test, it doesn't mean that it's useful for a real user in real life. Maybe a guy uh, doing something over a socket, as an example. Uh, so, okay, let's check out the FSM chart. And by the way, FSM, I don't, you didn't say, but it's a finite state machine. And uh, let's see how that looks. And uh, well, yes. This is my like first day at job and I go like, okay, mm, yep. Um, this, it, well, well, honestly, it makes me a little nervous to be, to be the least. So let's take a step back and you know, like, okay, let's do one step at a time. Um, it's, the key here is that Erlang and Elixir are very good friends. So let's try and make them play together. And, uh, the node project isn't the smallest and these guys has made fork of every possible thing because they needed to fix it. They keep giving back to the community, which is excellent and beautiful. And so my first approach was, okay, I just want to have something running and let me just see if I can take uh, some Erlang code and get it running. And uh, you know, like obviously this big project is like in Elixir, what we say an umbrella project. There's a lot of apps there. And if you get one app, obviously there's gonna be dependencies to other apps. Um, it's good or bad, I mean, but then again, I don't wanna be the whiny guy, you know, I, I need to get my stuff going. So it didn't work out for me. So I said instead, let's just add the whole node as a dependency in mix and let's see what happens. Actually, it does build prettily, but the thing is that it builds and it builds forever, but then nothing is really started. 
the applications aren't indexed, they are not started, and nothing is accessible. Doing some Googling on this topic, I just realized that no, no go on this one. This will not happen as it looks today. Uh, so umbrella in umbrella, mm, don't go there. Okay, so one step back again. So let's be creative again and let's, okay, let's try and fix these problems I had in my first attempt. Um, what I was doing in some, at some point was actually, I just had, I'm creating a new mix application. I'm copying in Erlang code and letting mix build it. And then obviously there's like some issues there. And as I, uh, you know, uh, as, I, as you can see here in my slide, I actually have H files in Erlang. Being a disembedded guy, I, I do, did enjoy H files a lot and C files and I've been, but, but it fascinates me that I actually, I don't, to be honest, I don't miss the H files in Elixir. Uh, uh, however, uh, I did get this thing to work and it was a mess, you could say. It ended up in being like a lot of scripting. I have like mix, uh, like mix new a lot of application. I do sparse checkout where I just do selective folders. I do some uh, Git patching, and then you know it all built. And once it built, I was like, oh, this like, pfft. what a relief. But you know, can I really build it again in a clean, clean folder? Yes, I could. And then you know, you lock down to specific commits, and then you pray that, hey, don't change the node code too much. I don't want to do this again. Dimitar Ivanov was my key here. We, we were bouncing a lot of ideas back and forth here. He was really good at this. Uh, this is a really shitty solution, to be honest, but it was able to get me started. And um, people weren't aware that this is like how it is, but it's, you know, you, you need, I needed to focus on what my task really was. So at the time, I was like, Ooh, okay, let's keep going because I need to produce some results in the topics where I was requested to. Uh, so, but just to say months down the road, I just realized that, you know, let's throw this out. And we were working on this plugin as a plugin concept, which Ulf just mentioned. And I was looking at using that. But when we discussed that, we just realized that, hey man, you don't need the, the plugin concept. Instead, you just take the beams and just index them. So this is all the code that's needed. And that's thanks to Carol, who's also in the, in the core team. Uh, and that's the best commit you can do ever. You just throw away a lot of code. It, the code used to be so instrumental to you, but now it's all clean and it's all pretty. You just download the node, you just index the files. Thanks for that, Carol. Uh, so I'm going to repeat a little what, what an FSM is again, but now I'm going to like, because it seems like uh, blockchains are a, a hard topic, state channel isn't an easier topic. So I think it, 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 it can be repeated. Um, so I would like to say that FSM is actually your support library. And as a programmer, you've used a lot of support libraries. And this is just another one. The difference here is it appears to be living somewhere else and it's connected to your computer over a WebSocket. Uh, well, it's tricky. Well, the WebSocket can go up and down. And yes, Ulf has uh, been, we had a lot of, a lot of issues has been posted on this, but because if you're disconnected and you want to reconnect, we need to know that you are you and so forth. And it makes stuff trickier. However, we got it running. And of course, if you're on a WebSocket, you be, need to be on a secure WebSocket. Uh, oh, okay. And what's a state channel then? Okay, it's like you go with your peer and you tell the blockchain, hey, we want to do like some stuff on the side here off-chain and when we say off-chain that is really off-chain just like no chain it could be a different network and you do your stuff there back and forth with your other peer we actually we don't denote this as initiator and responder and what you're doing is actually you're build it, building another block chain on your side and every new link or block in the blockchain world represents a state change the state change it means that something changed in the contract or the tokens were redistributed. Every step here is like denoted as a round. And in, in the blockchain world, the same word, the, the same denotion is nonce when it's on chain. 
Uh, and the thing is here, you only pay at the blockchain when you start and when you close at the best. You can do other things as well, but for, to keep it simple. In this state channel, uh, every link which is added on, uh, or every block which is added on your chain needs to be co-signed, which means that both of you need to approve that this is the same thing we just did. So it's a lot about checking what's going on here and you need to keep everything right. And to make that easier, you can deploy a contract in your channel. The smart, and that's a smart contract then. Uh, the smart contract is kind of the protocol which you're defining for, am I gonna show you a snippet from a game later on? If the smart contract is, is designed well enough, it will protect you and help you in, in situation where the other party is trying to be malicious. Uh, the other thing, of course, is, as Ulf mentioned, is that we are talking about like a real-time thingy here, which you don't get with, state, with real blockchains. We are interacting fairly quickly. We have this practical example, which I wanted to show you. And this is now, it's, it's, it's getting trickier as down the, the slides, but however, I, we just want to show it to you anyway. It's a backend who is gonna be a responder and you connect as the initiator. What you guys are gonna do is like, you're gonna flip some coin, you're gonna put some stake and you're gonna, the same stake, both of you, you're gonna flip a coin. And then the one who wins, is going to go away with a stake and then you can keep flipping 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 uh, in order to make this happen we have like specified our our game or let's say the protocol in this smart contract uh, it's deployed in the channel and you 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 obey you obey the contract otherwise it won't work if the other end tries to be malicious your fsm will support you uh, so let, let's talk about, uh, hang on, internally, go ahead, direct, okay. So let's talk about, uh, if we look at uh, examples, this is a contract example. It's uh, the Sophia language, which is used in the Eternity blockchain. And uh, uh, it just outlines how it looks. The whole contract is about 100 lines of code. And consistently, uh, a, a single game is, is contained in, in these three calls. You have the provide hash, where one of the parties is going to produce a hash, which is either uh, produced by a, sol by, a, by a salt and a pick of a, a coin of a side. It's a heads or a tails. Then the other end is going to make a pick. And lastly, we're going to reveal the result. And what we see when we do re reveal, it's going to end by, chaining, uh, by spending the coins to the appropriate winner of, the, of that round. We can do that over and over again until we'll ha we're happy or, one, or the coins get exhausted, tokens. If the other party appears to be malicious, then there's also some safety net in the contract. So for instance, if uh, if the other end doesn't want to reveal, like one of the end, then you're able to dispute the, given this, if the circumstances are right and the blockchain is high enough, you can take this piece of code and the FSM will help you execute that on chain. And what that means is this is what we call forced progress. This is, you have the right to perform this call. However, the other end refuses to sign it. So what we have here is like, you are really playing this game with the other pair and there's no mediator, obvious mediator in between you. You just go and mediate on chain if that is, if you end up in that situation. So you should be completely safe. And that's the unique thing with this. You're doing something which is fully safe to parties. Um, okay, so I'm gonna now try and show you how it looks. The channel service, so everything we do at Eternity obviously is available on GitHub, and so is the channel service. Uh, it contains a free components, it's the socket connector. It helps you manage the connection and gives you some helpers. You have the backend service where the game contract is, where the game logic is run from the backend perspective. And we have a channel interface 
which is a Phoenix based thing. And by the way, you guys who do Phoenix, great work. It was a new encounter for me, but I was up and running really quickly because it really, it shows you where you should put your code. And for me, that's a very mature framework. Thumbs up on that. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna now try to do this live actually and so show you how it looks. And this is what you do. It's like everything is dockerized and so forth. Let's see now if I can do my uh, sharing, get my sharing working on this. Um, I will share screen. Okay. So hopefully now you see my full desktop. Do you, Wolf? Yes, I think it says yes. I said yes. Yes. Let's try and run it. I just started the node locally. And everything here is locally. Now I start my, uh, my uh, Phoenix thingy and I load my page. So this is now what we see. And this is also reveals my skills of Phoenix. I'm happy that the style sheet was good already because I don't know those stuff yet. I'm on the learning curve. So I'm gonna initiate a game here. So I'm gonna ask the backend, hey, I wanna start a game. I click there, I started. And I'm the initiator, I wanna join the game. I'm connecting to the socket again, and I get a sign request. And this is where the journey starts. Now, you know, both parties needs to sign and agree that we wanna go off chain. Let's sign that and see what happens. We sign, and all suddenly, okay, the channel is open. What happened now is that the backend actually wants to add a block on our little blockchain, and that block is actually a request to, to add a new contract. Uh, I, I signed that, and we have a new contract in the chain. And these, this number here denotes the round, uh, the round, which means every new block on this thing. So let's see here. Okay, I'm gonna now say that, hey, I wanna play head. I'm the client. I'm calling this and obviously when I do something, I'm gonna need to sign it. Always get a sign request back. And the other end is gonna be asked to sign it as well. I sign it, the other end signs it silently. And now the other end made its, its guess. Uh, when the other end makes its guess, I need to sign it again, because again, we're gonna step out the round. Let's see the round here, we're now three. Once the other end has made its guess, we're gonna go up to four. I sign this, and we're up to four. Now I need to reveal, like, let me show, let, let's see how we ended up. Before I do this, I'm gonna query funds to see how much funds do we really have here. And what we're gonna see when we do reveal, is I do reveal and one of the balances should obviously change. So I do a contract 12 reveal. I sign that again because I need to sign what I'm doing. And again, we're gonna increase the round, sign that. And now we have a, a round which stepped up and I do query funds again. And then now I see that one of the balances increased. So one of the pairs actually won something. I can keep doing that here over and over again, but I guess you, 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 you've had enough probably with this gaming thing. However, I mean, this is available for, for all of you who wants to play with this, it's on GitHub. Um, once you're done here, what you do obviously is that you just shut down and the tokens are redistributed. The shutdown will go back to the chain and that's also why you will need to pay a fee to the on-chain operation. I try shutdown, again, surprise, surprise, I need to sign, both end signs, we're done. Um, that's, that's what I have, guys. So thank you for listening to me and Ulf. Maybe we could mention, you see a lot of stuff going on there. When we automate this, automate the signing, typically you would see like 30 to 50 or slightly above, uh, contract calls per second on one channel. Mm. So that would roughly be the performance that you could aim for. It's not lightning fast, but also pretty scalable because, well, you can run. This will scale horizontally. Yeah. 
Excellent. Thank you. This was a great presentation. Thank you both. Unfortunately, we have run out of time, so we won't be able to address any questions live, but please check the session Q&A tab and address any questions there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.